I believe now we are good to go. So welcome and thank you everyone for joining this webinar. I'm Komal Kanojia, working as brand manager with IVA, a division of MCURE. MCURE is the pioneer in the field of gynecology and IVF. IVA is on a mission to nurture and support 28 days of ovarian cycle. And our scientific theme for the year is Programming 28. Hence, our webinar are also called as Programming 28 webinars. So Programming 28 is based on the concept of managing the ovarian cycle and uh, by giving GNRH analogs, gonadotropins, hormone, as per the different protocols. We as team IVA are equally proud to host this Programming 28 webinar today. So this webinar recordings are also available on a YouTube channel known as IVA, IVF Virtual Academy. Materna is our core brand and is an epitome of quality. It is available as Materna, HMG, HCG, RFSH, Depot, and LMD. Today, I'm very thankful to Dr. Ved Prakash to give us an opportunity to host this event. Theme of the webinar is Frozen at minus 196, Life in Suspended Animation. So would like to introduce our coordinator for the event today, Dr. Rahul Sen, Dr. Santesh Dumal Satya, and Dr. Uh, Akash Agrawal. So now, uh, Dr. Rahul Sen, over to you, sir. Hello. Yeah, yeah, very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Pomal. And uh, so taking forward the session, I'll be introducing today's uh, first moderator. So Dr. Sanjay Shukla, sir. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sanjay Shukla, sir, uh, who is currently working as lab director at uh, Bahiti Hospital, Jaipur and Shivani IVF Fund Fertility Center, Jaipur. And uh, sir, has, uh, sir holds a PhD in life sciences and uh, worked on early diagnosis of typhoid fever. And uh, sir has been working in the field of human reproduction since 1998. And sir obtained his fellowship in the year 2006 in the biology of reproduction from Centro D Studios in Gynecology of Reproduction, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And uh, sir is serving as vice president of uh, Academy of Clinical Immunologists, India. And uh, sir is also holding a position of academic wing chairman at uh, Academy of Clinical Knowledge India. So welcome, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Sanket. Um, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, this is my privilege to introduce uh, our first speaker and a good friend, Dr. Goral Gandhi. Uh, as um, I'm sure everyone uh, knows her very well as a synonym for the uh, vitrification or uh, cryobiology in India. Uh, Goral is the founder and scientific director of at uh, Indonipam IVF Mumbai. Uh, she also runs an international school where she trains the uh, budding embryologists and those who want to hone their skills. She had a master's in applied biology from King Edward Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, uh, worked on quality control in laboratories. Uh, she subsequently served as a research fellow at IVF Laboratory of the University Hospital Belgium and Egyptian IVF Center Cairo. She has a vast experience in the field, and uh, if I continue um, enumerating those things, it will take um, another session. So I uh, straightforward um, invite her to uh, deliver her talk. Dr. Gurl, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Shukla, for a very kind introduction. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers of IHERA and congratulate them to uh, week after week organizing such wonderful programs and disseminating the knowledge. So today, uh, the title of my talk is, uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Komal. Uh, yes, doctor, you are co-host. You can share it. I believe there should be. It says one person can share at a time. Sanket, I think you have to stop yeah, sharing. Yeah. Dr. Sanket, please stop sharing. I've already stopped sharing, sir. Okay, now I believe you can share. 
this type. Ma'am, try once again, ma'am. Yeah, now I can. Okay. Okay. So the title of my talk today is From Embryo to Oocyte Vitrification. Now, with the advent of embryo preservation, it was the very revolutionary thing and a very, very critical development in the field of reproductive medicine. Over the years, as we know, embryo craft preservation has gained tremendous importance. Uh, today, we are seeing more and more of all our embryo transfers becoming frozen embryo transfers. One of the most important things that we are doing today in our labs is cryopreserving all the supernumerary embryos and uh, moving towards, we are decreasing the number of embryos we are transferring and we are gradually moving towards elective single embryo transfer. Even though it is still not a mandate, we are still, more and more laboratories are doing elective single embryo transfer, at least for good prognosis patients. We know that embryo cryopreservation is a great tool for prevention of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, we have uh, ovarian hyperstimulation, the freeze-all approach is used to prevent, not just to prevent OHSS, but for a lot of other indications. If we are waiting for our genetic diagnosis, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis results from the lab, we have to freeze all the embryos. Many a times we do the freeze-all approach just to have a better embryo endometrium synchrony. Sometimes we take the freeze-all approach for a better coordination of our donor oocyte program. So there are many, many reasons why we freeze all embryos. And the reason why we are able to do this is this wonderful technology called vitrification. Vitrification has been a game changer in the field of IVF. And today, of course, fertility preservation for women, for cancer women, as well as social egg freezing has become a significant science by itself. More and more women are opting for social egg freezing because we can freeze oocytes so efficiently, we are able to extend the reproductive uh, potential of women. Their reproductive potential is now just not limited to few years. They can choose to become a mother as and when they are ready to become a mother, as and when they choose. So this is a very important word, choice. Now they have a choice to become pregnant. If they want to become little later in life, this choice is important available to them. So all this is because of the development in the field of cryobiology. If we look at the historical perspectives of cryopreservation, the first ever pregnancy derived from a frozen human embryo was reported by Trossen and Linda Moore in 1983. And although this fetus aborted in spontaneous abortion at about 10 weeks of gestation, and the first babies from frozen embryos were derived from uh, frozen embryos in 1983, December in Netherlands. But we all must always remember, and it must be noted that our own Subhash Mukherjee from Calcutta reported the first uh, successful crowd preservation of an eight cell embryo, storing it for 53 days, thawing and replacing it into the mother's womb, resulting in a successful live birth as early as 1978, a full five years be before Tronson and Moore had done so. And a small publication of Mukherjee in 1978 clearly shows that Mukherjee was on the right line of thinking much before anyone else had demonstrated the successful outcome of a frozen embryo. The slide is not moving forward. Can you hear me? 
Uh, doctor, so just click on the slide anywhere. Just yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the initial difficulties faced by the early workers were tremendous. And very early in the study of crab preservation, two opposing schools of thoughts were developed. Slow freezing, one was slow freezing with gradual desiccation of the cells and taking them from 37 degrees to minus 196 in about three to four hours. And a radically opposite approach was ultra rapid freezing of small volumes, also known as vitrification. Well, it has really been a very long journey from those early days of slow freezing cleavage stage embryos to the great painstaking research and development leading to the present day triumph where we can confidently report as high as more than 99% survival rates for embryos, blastocysts, as well as oocytes. The term vitrification originates from the Latin word vitrium or glass, which describes the transformation of a substance into non-crystalline amorphous solid. The process commonly involves rapid cooling of liquid so that it passes through glass transition to form a vitrified solid. So vitrification by definition is to obtain an amorphous state without ice crystal formation. Now this ice crystals were the culprit for slow freezing. We were not getting good survival rates because of the damaging ice crystals that were happening in the slow freezing of embryos. If we have even just 3% of intracellular water converting into ice crystals, we can have cell death. So it was very, very important to avoid this ice crystal formation. Faye and Roll, uh, Roll had found that in order to vitrify pure water, a cooling rate of as high as 100 by 10 raised to 60 centigrade per minute is required. Now, since this is obviously not feasible to achieve vitrification, one needs to increase the concentration of cryoprotectants in the solution, as well as reduce the volume of the solution. This concept is the current basis for clinically applied vitrification. So if we have to say the same thing mathematically, the probability of vitrification is equal to the cooling and warming rate, the viscosity of the solution, which is the concentration of cryoprotectants into the solution divided by volume. So lower the volume, higher the concentration of cryoprotectants, the higher cooling and warming rates we are going to get and the probability of vitrification is going to increase. The probability of no ice crystal formation is going to increase. So what are the objectives that we are trying to achieve when we crowd preserve any tissue? We want reversible arrest of metabolism of that tissue, maintaining its structural and genetic integrity. And whenever we are going to use it, we want to achieve acceptable survival rate of the plant and maintain competence to achieve acceptable life loss. These are the objectives that we are trying to achieve. And how do we do this? The answer is to use an established protocol. So what do we call an established protocol? To be clinically accepted worldwide, a protocol must be reliable. This means that we must get consistently, repeatedly very high survival rates. The protocol must be universal, means constant high survival rates must be achieved by all laboratories and not just few. When we were doing slow freezing, there were some labs which we were very good at it, but most of us were not. We were struggling with slow freezing. It was not a universal protocol. So to be have to be called a very well-established robust protocol, it has to be universally good. There are mainly four principal steps in vitrification. The first step is to add cryoprotectants to protect our tissue. We are going to freeze them, subject them to minus 156 degrees centigrade temperature. So we have to protect them from any kind of cryo damage. And this is done by addition of cryoprotectants. Next, 
we cool the cells to minus 196 degrees centigrade and we store them at minus 196 very safely till we come to step three where we are going to warm these tissue. And then slowly we are going to do the exact reverse of vitrification. We are going to remove all the cryoprotectants and bring the cell back to life. So these are the four simple steps involved in vitrification. But there are many factors within these four steps that are going to influence your outcomes. First and foremost, the protocol that you use for vitrification. The cryoprotectant that are used, which make up the solutions. The cooling rate and warming rates that you achieve during the procedures. The type of carrier device. The temperature of vitrification solution at exposure. The duration of exposure to the cryoprotectant. The volume of the vitrification solution. And last but not least, the experience of the operator. All these factors are extremely important to achieve very high survival rates and subsequent pregnancy rates. So very quickly, I want to share some tips with you to optimize your protocol. Now, if you remember the mathematical formula that we saw earlier, we need to use high concentration of cryoprotectants in our vitrification solution. In fact, the concentration of cryoprotectants that we use in vitrification solutions is much higher than what was used in slow freezing. And this is one thing that all of us must remember. We have to be very aware of the high concentration of cryoprotectants that we are dealing with. Now, the toxicity of cryoprotectants is correlated to its concentration, the time of exposure, and the temperature. The fast entrance and the degree of toxicity of the cryoprotectant can be influenced by temperature. And it has been shown that using cryoprotectants, especially those containing DMSO, at room temperature of about 22 to 25 degrees or lower, rather than 37 degrees, may decrease their toxicity. So this is one very important thing to remember. While vitrification, turn off your stage heating. Read your manufacturer's instructions that come with the media, read the booklet, and if it is asking you to do it between 22 to 25 degrees, please turn off the stage heating and do the procedure. The time. As all cryoprotectants are toxic, it is important to watch the duration of exposure to the final cryoprotectant very carefully before plunging the cells into liquid nitrogen. And here, a protocol that is two-step equilibration is very important. It helps to reduce the toxicity. So the first step, in the first step, we equilibrate at a much lower cryoprotectant concentration for a sufficient time for complete removal of intracellular water, for complete dehydration of the cell. And this first step is followed by the next step, which is a very short, just about one minute of vitrification in the final vitrification solution, which is a high cryoprotectant concentration. So please watch the time duration and ensure that you equilibrate enough for complete dehydration of the embryo or the oocyte. Some practical tips while loading the catheter. Choose an easy method. Don't use a method which is very complicated or don't use a sim don't make a simple method complicated by you know varying the protocol or doing something else because this means more room for errors. So choose an easy, simple protocol. Choose your tools carefully. Choose your wells and dishes in such a way that you don't have much blind space in those wells where you can lose your embryos. Remember, these solutions, again, have high concentration of cryoprotectant. The osmolarity is very high. It is little difficult to uh, uh, spot your embryos and oocytes. So choose uh, your wells and plates carefully. While loading, if vitrifying more than one oocyte or embryo on a device, then it is preferable to make multiple small drops with one embryo each instead of making one large drop of embryos. So make small, small drops which, have, which will have your two, three, four, whatever oocytes you want to keep 
on the straw like this in small drops. But again, it is very important to follow manufacturer's instructions as this would depend on the vitrification ability of the media constituents. So always it is recommended at each step to follow the protocol that is recommended by the whatever media you are using. Coming to the warming rate. Now remember, majority of injuries and damage during crop preservation happen due ice crystal formation. And during warming, there are very high chances of ice crystal formation. High warming rate will prevent the vitreous water presenting cells from crystallization at the time of warming. So this is a very, very critical procedural factor affecting survival. The first step of warming, where you are dipping your uh, straw with the embryos into your first thawing solution. So this is a very important step and this has to be achieved with utmost efficiency. This step I cannot overemphasize to do it very, very carefully. Open system versus closed system, much has been said about the safety and the risk of contamination through the use of open system. But we must remember that no such disease transfer has yet been reported in spite of so many, so many cases being done. So, and as far as efficiency, closed systems are uh, not so efficient as the open systems and open systems, the survival rates are much better for oocytes and embryos. Just very quickly, we don't have much time, but just I want to share a few tips for oocytes. Uh, oocytes are very, very special cell. They are the biggest cell in human body. So very lot of cryo challenges associated with cryo survival. So a very, very careful approach has to be taken for oocyte freezing. One of the most important factor is the meiotic spindle. The spindle is very sensitive to cryoprotectants and low temperatures. Oocytes analyzed immediately after thawing displayed severe disorganization or disappearance of spindles and incubation of one to three hours resulted in recovery of spindles. So we have to think of the spindle recovery, but we also have to think about oocyte aging because the optimum time for ICSI for human oocytes is between 37 to 41 hours post HCG. And inseminating oocytes soon after thawing when there is serious spindle disorganization adversely affects fertilization outcome. So to overcome this, if you are doing your oocyte retrieval at 35 hours post HCG, Please freeze your oocytes within two hours of retrieval. So you are going to freeze at 37 hours post HCG, and then you wait for three hours and you do your ICSI at 40 hours post HCG. This way you have given enough time for spindle recovery and you are still within the time limit to perform ICSI. So oocyte freezing has a very, very high learning curve and all the small tips and tricks you have to remember and follow them very carefully to have acceptable survival rates. Vitrification is highly skill dependent and stringent adherence to the protocol cannot be overemphasized. Do not make your own changes to the protocol. Please try and follow the manufacturer's guidelines to the protocol. So there is finally, if there is any secret to high survival rate, it is all these factors. It is the right protocol to choose to have right tools with you and begin with a reasonable cell quality, then you are bound to get 100% survival. We have such robust protocol now available for vitrification. So everybody who follows these things carefully is going to get 100% survival. It is a cumulative effect of many small efforts to minimize all possible damage to the cells. You have to remember at each and every step that you are not doing any damage to your embryos, any damage to your cells. So if you keep remembering this one simple fact in your mind, then you are going to get 100% survival. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goral. You are bang on time. Yeah, I tried to be. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so uh, do we have any time to, uh, for interaction? Any question answers? Yes, sir, please, please, please. You can take. So are there any questions in the uh, 
QA box because I cannot see any QA box here. No, there is no question actually. I think Anyways, once... I have I have a few questions and other panelists can also ask. So, yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Goral, this is uh, just for uh, like those who are beginners and the novice. Um, okay. What is the role of the the size of the uh, uh, handling pipette? Oh, that is very, very important. So because in vitrification, remember, it is minimal volume. So try and choose a pipette. If you are doing pipette stage embryos, then try and choose a pipette, which is about 140 to 150 micron. And for blastocysts, choose the pipette accordingly. And uh, you must not have a very large pipette and you must not have a very small pipette. So pipette size is extremely important and choose it as per the cell that you are doing. If it is oocytes and embryos, choose about 140 to 150, 160 micron. And for blastocysts, choose the higher micron pipette. Because we don't want to take extra volume at each step while uh, loading and from, you know, transferring from one well to another. Uh, right. Can, Even can, like, yes, yes. Can I ask uh, one basic yes. question, uh, Goral, which uh, I come across uh, uh, so many times. How yeah. many oocytes per cryo device you recommend to freeze? That is first thing. And uh, as a person or in a beginner, uh, if someone wants to freeze the oocyte, how many oocytes he or she should take at a time before starting the freezing? That means, like suppose there are 10 oocytes. So she should take 10 or she should take first three oocytes and gradually then remaining other oocytes she should freeze. Yes, so, so coming to your first question, how many can you put? It really depends on your efficiency, but I wouldn't recommend putting more than three. At the most, if you are very good, put four, but don't put more than that. And you have to be extremely good with oocytes are very, very fragile. So remember, it is not just freezing. Freezing is easy. You also have to thaw them efficiently. So if you end up putting five or six oocytes on one straw, then while thawing, you may take, you know, a little longer and it is not going to help. So even with an inexpert hands, don't put more than four. Begin with one, two, and for beginners, please begin just with one. Just begin with one oocyte. See to it that it is, you know, you're throwing it very, very well. It is developing, do ICSI on them. And whether they are developing into good quality blaster cyst, what is happening? And gradually, please, it's a very long learning curve. Begin with one, then go on to, to add oocyte at a time on your cryo device. It is not with embryo cryo preservation, you start getting success very easily, even beginners, but with oocytes, everything has to be perfect. So you just cannot afford to, you know, just start taking three or four oocytes right from the beginning. And even if you have 10 oocytes, just put three in your ES at a time. Finish those three, then come back and put more. So Take a very safe approach. Take a very, okay. very safe approach. Yourself will know that you can now graduate and take some. And uh, what is your uh, suggestion or take home about the quality of embryos? Like one, one should expect uh, good survival out of uh, which grade of embryos when they freeze? Because it is very commonly seen that at the time of freezing, the quality was uh, good, embryo was good, but the survival is very bad. So what all? factors may affect the survival of uh, embryo. Is it quality or is it uh, mainly the procedure performed, the process involved? According to me, very frankly, even grade C and grade B embryos are surviving perfectly. Of course, we don't expect much after a grade D embryo. We, it doesn't have much potential as it is, but they survive very well. It, they just come out as they were, most of them. So. I feel it is most of the times it is procedural. If you freeze a good grade embryo while thawing, it is it cannot become bad. It has to be procedural. You have to look at what is gone wrong within your your lab setup. Okay. So embryos do come out just just the way you put them, they come out. So I think you just answer one of the uh, attendees' question. 
uh, she asked the same question that why do some embryos survive and others don't? Um, no, embryos are going to survive. Whenever you see this, please look into your protocol. Yes. And uh, there is uh, most frequently asked questions. How long should we wait between denudation and oocyte vitrification? Uh, denudation and oocyte vitrification, not much. Not much. So we always, you know, I, I denude just before ICSI. So I, I like to keep them with the cumulus till I'm ready to either do ICSI or vitrify them. Yeah, so people should understand that once you denude the oocyte, you are exposing them to stress. And right. uh, so keep them with cumulus and freeze yeah. within two hours. That is very, very important. Yeah. You know, so that you have enough time after thawing. Remember, you have to wait for two to three hours after thawing. Correct. So you have to freeze within good time. Don't wait for three, four hours. So don't keep too many vitrification procedures in a day if you are alone. So all right. these things, the scheduling is very, very important for oocyte vitrification cases. Yes. So, so scheduling, don't planning, don't get yeah. good results if all these things are not taken care of. Right. So one should it be very vigilant about the workload and the number of staff that is available to do the job. Perfect. Absolutely. Another question, I, I think you have already answered, but you can reiterate the importance of the protocols or the written instructions that are given by different manufacturers. The attendee asks why we want to equilibrate the warming medium at 37. Some protocols say equilibrate at room temperature. So just just let yeah it is you know the manufacturers the scientists have developed these protocols with lots and lots of research they have done experiments on tens of thousands of oocytes and you know millions of oocytes probably and then arrived at these protocols 37 degrees the first thawing solution warming it at 37 degrees extremely important because as we had seen in the slide high warming rates are even more crucial to survival than high freezing rates and only if your ts is at 37 degrees you are going to get this high warming rate of 42000 degrees centigrade per minute so it is extremely important now some manufacturers say that you have your equilibration at room temperature because the, the vitrification, the cryoprotectants are, the solutions are designed in such a way, the toxicity of cryoprotectant increases with temperature. At 37 degrees, the rate at which the cryoprotectant in, enters the cell increases, right. thereby increasing the toxicity. Remember, cryoprotectants are double-edged sword. It is protecting the cryo, our tissue, they are very important, but at the same time, they are toxic. They have the inherent toxicity. So remember this while using your vitrification solutions. And if the manufacturer has said room temperature, then we use them at room temperature. It is these small, small things that makes a difference in 90% survival and 100% survival. These are the things that are going to make a difference. It is not that you will not. You may say that, okay, I'm getting 90% survival, but Today, as per the SJ consensus, the KPI for blastocyst is more than 99%. These are all aspirational benchmarks, which today in 2021, we have to strive to achieve. And we will be able to achieve this only if we follow the protocol. We have not done the experiments, so we cannot change the protocols at our whims. And just because you don't understand the reason doesn't mean that you can change it. Right. So another word of caution from you about the droplet uh, vitrification. Oh my God. No, the vol yes. volume that Again, people use. Yeah. A small volume. Yeah. No. Vitrification is a lot about physics. We have to protect the cells from cryo damage as well as osmotic damage. There is a lot of osmotic damage during vitrification. So you know, if all your protocols are so detailed, they are going to tell you that take, you know, for example, certain protocols take 300 microliter, put your uh, embryo at the top, then put it at the middle, put it at the bottom. How do you do all this in droplet? You cannot do it. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the whole principle of vitrification is based on these temperature, the volumes and everything. 
So if you want 100% survival for your oocytes, then you need to follow these protocols. In droplet method, you may get 90%, but then you are going to be stuck at it. If you are satisfied it, with this 90%, it's, you know, you, you have to decide to strike a balance, what is more important. The cost of one oocyte is how much we all know that, you know, it is, I don't know, 10,000 rupees, 15,000 rupees. And what is the cost of these media? So you have to you know, think about it, even if you're talking about cost consideration, because that's the only consideration when you do mere droplet culture, droplet uh, vitrification. And we are not just considering the financial cost, the emotional cost that is involved in this. Absolutely, huge. that is priceless. That is priceless, especially if you're doing fertility preservation. Right. So uh, Nishad wants to know which is the best stage to freeze embryos, to get best implantation rate. So there are two uh, things involved, not just the um, survival, but implantation rate also. Yes, so this is again a very individual question. I think it's a topic by itself, Nishad. Right. And I think it really depends on your transfer policy. I feel that, you know, if you're transferring at cleavage stage, then you know, probably grow the supernumerary embryos to blastocyst. If you have a good blastocyst uh, program in your lab, you know, if you're confident about the blastulation rate, if you're confident about your culture conditions, then, you know, grow them to blastocyst because you'll end up freezing less. You'll end up, you know, not freezing those embryos which are not meant to become blastocyst. So I, I always like to freeze at blastocyst, but as far as survival and implantation rate is concerned, we know that you know, ultimately the cumulative pregnancy rate is same for cleavage stage and blastocyst stage, but the implantation rate of blastocyst is more because, you know, they've passed a survival test in the lab. So it is, I feel very individual, but blastocyst <coughs> is the advantage of freeze less. So the last question, I guess, uh, uh, I don't, I cannot understand. Uh, but it is, uh, I think, what is the safe maximum time to do ICSI after uh, thawing? It depends. Always calculate your time post HCG. Right. So, so if, you know, if you have taken four hours for freezing, then you have, you know, you've already passed the time. So calculate your time post HCG. And I think even you know, 42 hours, maybe 42 hours post HCG. Yes, because we believe that it should be between 39 and 42 hours. We yes. usually do exceed in this yeah. time period. So I think the same principle that, that applies. That is ideal, you know, it is the same principle. So yes. try and always calculate your time post HCG. So always remember whenever you are freezing oocytes in your register, note down the post HCG time when you are vitrified. So you'll know exactly because it will vary from patient to patient. Mm -hmm. So you will know that in certain case you have vitrified very late. So probably you don't have much time and you must do ICSI within two, two and a half hours. Uh, Dr. Ved, do we have uh, time to take another question? No, sir. We have, uh, I think, uh, we have to right, So probably we can ask many more questions in coming webinars. <laughs> Thank you, Goral. Thank you very much for your wonderful Thank you. talk. It's and a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Shukla sir, and uh, thank you so much, Gaurav ma'am, for taking us through the wonderful journey of career preservation. So, taking forward the session, I'll be introducing the next moderator. Dr. Jar Charudat Joshi. So, sir has done his uh, post-graduation in life sciences in the year 1983 and uh, obtained special training in ICSI, IVF, uh, and from Genk, Belgium and uh, embryo freezing KK Women's Hospital, Singapore. And uh, we obtained special training in uh, laser rester hatching from Belgium in the year 2006. And then a special training in PGD from Germany, 2008. Sir obtained his doctorate in life sciences in the year 2018. And uh, sir is serving as executive committee member for uh, MP ESR and ISS chapters. And sir served as past president and uh, vice president for Academy of Clinical Embryologists. Can, sir, currently serving as medical director at uh, G India IIT Bank. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Sanket, uh, for a kind introduction. 
and um, uh, it is my privilege and uh, honor to introduce uh, dr keshi uh, we we all have seen him uh, from last so many years and i believe he is uh, he is the person of principle he, he he follows the standard guidelines and always stick to try to stick to them and um, we always uh, uh, listen uh, very uh, authentic and very good information uh, sub related to the subject so um, welcome dr kersi avri he his education qualification is his phd in reproductive endocrinology and uh, has many publications 18 publications till now specialization human embryology and assisted reproductive technology he is a very good teacher and teaching embryology from last so many years we all have seen him is a uh, chief area uh, chief areas of interest is assisted reproductive technology uh, application support and troubleshooting cryobiology electron microscopy and uh, he is currently working as founder director embryology academy of research and training ert consultant freelance embryologist uh, application support specialist art in embryology and cryobiology chief instructor in art trained doctors from all over the globe work in collaboration with doctors in india and abroad in super specialty fields and uh, he has been invited as speaker to deliver lectures in field of embryology at national and international level symposium symposia conference and he has conducted many workshops so uh, welcome dr kersi uh, he is going to enlighten us about the inventory management or the cryo management uh, of the records and uh, Uh, what what all precaution one should take uh, during maintaining the uh, invent so over to you dr kersi a uh, doctor please unmute yourself unmute, unmute. kersi sir kersi sir please unmute yeah, yeah. now you can hear me loud and clear yes yes yes, yes sir anyway so a good evening to all of you and i hope ke in this trying times you are literally well amongst the little cocoon of your houses and not venturing outside at the onset i would like to extend my heartiest thanks and congratulations to ihera and to the organizers of mcure of having held this conference or held this seminar and cherry pick certain faculty all subject specific now it's a pleasure talking on a subject which has so much importance in embryology the cryobiology now we know that cryobiology and its dependency is increasing by leaps and bounds now akin to embryology wherein we have got or we have registered or we have attended to a number of conferences number of seminars all on the qa qc lab management this that blah 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 the list is endless but i have seen that the little attention or a care is lacking as far as cryo care is concerned means what we feel that cryo is something like just take the cryo cans charge them with nitrogen functionalize them dip your gametes thaw them and that's it occasionally replenish it there are peripheral gadgetries available with the prices touching the roof as i always say that art is will power versus bill power now it doesn't mean that for a small center to function they need to document all the listed gadgets all available in the market and make your lab a display for all the units but there are certain basic things which need to be looked into with in depth with detail and hence i have just tried i would say this is also a little of an initial attempt to foray myself into this cryo care field and to make people aware though please remember i am not talking gospel or it's not okay i say the dictum is there and everybody has to follow so with this slight bit of introduction and a new venture into the new field i am just going across it's okay now this is where we deal with the science of cryogenics now what is cryogenics we are handling liquid nitrogen we talked about fantastic survivals in cryo we tried about optimal recovery optimal functionality optimal viability optimal survival but had these things been possible if the optimal utilization and understanding of cryogenics was not there no so basically cryogenics is a science of ultra low temperatures achieved 
by liquefaction of certain gases because that's the physics now this chapter or this topic will be involving a more of physics rather than embryology so well it might be a little bit of boring to some of you or it might be a little off track because certain cryogenic liquids have got very very sensitive and a precise property of freezing and preserving tissues sense damage hence at very low temperature freezing as low as minus 90 to minus 130 fahrenheit they have been extensively used in cryogenics and in human embryology nitrogen is the most exploited liquefied gas the other ones are helium hydrogen fluorine argon oxygen itself and methane now in the lower bracket i have mentioned the certain properties of cryogenic fluids most important low temperature second large ratio of expansion in the volume ratio from liquid to gas which is quite obvious from the fact that when we pour a little bit out there is a huge fumarole of gas surrounding your cryo chamber or your liquid nitrogen canister or your divar because majority of the liquids are odorless and colorless when they are vaporized to gas now these are the fundamentals so in physics cryogenics is a production and behavior of materials at very low temperature and this low temperature can be judged in centigrade as well as the kelvin the details of which are given the conversion of celsius to fahrenheit now here as far as temperature gradation is concerned we always measure vis a vis fahrenheit centigrade and kelvin the details which we will be following in my subsequent slides so here a little bit of a biodata of nitrogen its physical property inert gas colorless odorless and tasteless but that doesn't make it absolutely safe to use which will be of course following in the next slides density melting point and boiling point the insert shows atomic number atomic weight configuration and its placement in the periodic table and the crystalline structure oops what did i do fine now these are a few cryogens what is the first property which we take advantage of the boiling points and the expansion ratio now here in this table i have mentioned helium would have been the best the lightest available gas on the planet earth hydrogen nitrogen argon oxygen methane now these boiling points subsequently occur when these super cool gases are heated and for them to be heated is even if you place a simple pin or drop a pin into liquid nitrogen you see the sudden burst of a fumarol comes in and there is a sudden spurt of an event now this proves that your gas has been compressed under a certain atmosphere pressures now what is a standard atmosphere pressure a standard atmosphere or unit of pressure is equal to one mean atmospheric pressure which at sea level is termed as ntp normal temperature of pressure at one atmosphere which is 76 mm of mercury as it supports the column and the weight the weight could be termed as one atmosphere which equals to a pascal now pascal is also a unit of pressure so whenever in cylinders and many of the gases we always find the pressure or in a tire pressure it is psi pounds per square inch now 1 pascal is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch so this you can judge how much pressure is ultimately responsible for the transition of a state from one to another that is from a gas to a liquid release the pressure reverse the transition from liquid to the gas oops sorry sorry i lost yes yeah now how does this low temperature help us 
the lower the temperature, the longer the storage period. Because it is at this low temperature, organelles, cells, matrix, biological, biological tissues are not damaged. Even at minus 80 degrees using solid carbon dioxide, we can manage it. But for continuous unaffected preservation, we need super cool temperatures whereby literally all biological activity comes to a complete standstill. And this is what we call it as the glass transition temperature. Because in glass transition temperature, it's a range where the polymerized substrate changes from a glassy material to a soft non metal material. Now, till today, there was a debate whether prolonged cryopreservation affects the quality of the subsequently thawed material. This is still in limbo as there are equally yeses and noes. But after some time, it was done okay. okay. I think there's a lot of background noise. Now preservation at minus 196. Why is a cell not traumatized in liquid nitrogen at such sub-zero temperature? Because there is virtually no movement of atoms or molecules. At this time, the only thing which can affect its integrity is the radiation or a cosmic radiation. Though at low temperatures of minus 130, there can still be a moment of atoms and molecules. And at minus 90, even a thing will be solidified, rock solid. But still, there is a chance of a development of ice crystals, which can subsequently defect the cytoarchitecture of the cell, displace the organelles. So subsequently, post-thawing, in spite of your post thaw stuff looking fantastically good, you are not sure about its viability. So short exposure even to high temperature. Now, why this is mentioned as high temperature? Because compared to minus 197, minus 90 is definitely considered as a high temperature. And so is minus 130. That's the reason many a times it was argued that please maintain the levels of nitrogen in your canisters or your divas because freezing in a vapor is not all that advisable compared to the freezing which is obtained when the samples are immersed in liquid nitrogen. Now, what happens when? When we put them in cryonitrogen, it is known as a cryogenic sleep. We go into a continuous state of animation. So by keeping this body at low temperatures, the metabolism is reduced to possible lowest level. Plus, cryosleep essentially slows down the aging process to a point where there is any change or the change is as negligible as far as body's metabolism is concerned. Now, what it is? Liquid nitrogen plant, the atmospheric air is compressed to a seven bar pressure. Now the bar con conversion we studied in the previous slide. And then it is done by fractional distillation of air. Now here still I have mentioned one bar is equal to nearly one standard atmosphere. And the common units of pressure I have listed over here. They are tor, pascal, kilopascal, bars, millibars and pounds per square inch. Now, this is very important as far as thermodynamics regulation is concerned because Kelvin or the absolute zero. Now, Kelvin is a temperature scale designed so that zero degrees Kelvin is termed as absolute zero. Because it's a hypothetical temperature where it is total standstill or a sudden freezing of all biological activity. I don't think anybody can actually achieve the Kelvin temperature. But sub-zeros, and when we say Kelvin, it means that this is in an another animated body condition. And this Kelvin was designed by Dr. Kelvin himself, the photo of whom is mentioned over here. So it is a thermodynamic temperature unit. 
a, a diagram as to show you how fractional distillation of liquefied air takes place depending upon the different boiling points of the gases where is the chunk of the content is nitrogen and oxygen so this difference is taken just like when we prepare the oil from the fractionating column of liquefied mineral um, mineral oil there are different cracking points therefore we get the crude we get the liquefied petroleum we get the light oil we get the paraffin oil etc etc so this difference in the temperatures of its boiling points has helped us harvest the liquid nitrogen at a certain temperature now is liquid nitrogen the only gold standard for sample storage well yes because in a sample storage what have we to evaluate the molecular contents the biological activity the biochemical the rna they don't get compromised in a nutshell they don't get deactivated so in the scale of the deterioration the diminished rna quantity or a quality which was judged is known as the rna integrity number which was rated from 1 to 10 so cellular and mole biological trauma after prolonged suspension in nitrogen can also creep in and it will depend upon the way in which the sample is frozen what type of sample is frozen what grade of sample is frozen and how strict are your protocols utilized how fresh are your cryoprotectants and how skillful and the dexterity of the embryologist using these things is concerned evaporation liquid nitrogen has a large expansion ratio 1 liter of liquid nitrogen can result in 700 liters of gas so only relatively small amount of ln2 has to evaporate in a small compact room thereby it can result in a severe oxygen deficiency atmosphere and what does this result in it may form asphyxia without any warning so it has its own plus points and own negative points there are biological hazards there are environmental hazards there are cold injuries but so far actual environmental hazard has not been much documented the golden advices utilize it in a well ventilated room so as to not cause the proportionality of nitrogen to increase in that room thereby reducing the oxygen content and causing trauma to the survivor or the handler now where they are stored well we have got devas now these devas are different types we you know different branch shapes sizes biological to store the biological tissue transport for the transportation ones we have got vapor shippers for long distance transportation we even use small stainless steel thermos flasks for a few while transportation just a few kilometers away distance so these are basically the gadgets in which safe and secure transportation of these cryogenics are concerned but please use a cryogenic container for that suitable respective gas only just like when we utilize the regulators a co2 regulator is always used on a co2 cylinder and an oxygen or an oxygen cylinder so this is what we have to be sure as far as the qa qc of this cryogenics is concerned now what are they actually now they are modified thermos flask now you know what is a thermos flask well it's a glass flask kept in a metallic container and it's an insulating storage vessel into which the contents maintain their temperature hot or cold for a prolonged period of time because inside there are two metallic glasses bottles 
the construction I'm showing you in the next slide, the principle is all the three modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation are minimized to negligible limits so as to ensure and assure a novel way of temperature preservation. Now, this is exactly how your flasks will look. Extremely thin coated glass joint at the rim. Now this is one, this is in another. There is no point of contact except at the head part. So conduction is prevented. And you all know what conduction is, transfer of heat between two adjacent located atoms, whereby with the hyperactivation, which is heat in use, the heat is transferred from one to one to the third to the fourth. It's like you take a long pin, hold it in a flame. It will take two, a second or more before you just drop it because of the heat. If you take a smaller pin, the heat transferred or the heat conducted would be faster. Fine. Second, the space emits these two glass jars is a perfect vacuum. So convection is prevented because there is no material left for which the heat can be transferred. Radiation, it doesn't need any media. It is just thermodynamically transferred heat waves. Now this is prevented by what? The silver lining, the outer side of the inner bottle and the inner side of the outer bottle are silvered. And when a thing is silver, the dynamic coefficient of heat absorption is reduced to a literal zero. So all the modus operandi or all the three ways of heat transmission is negated. Furthermore, the whole console is inserted into a metallic body, taking care that no part touches the outside jacket. So to prevent a wobble, either a rubber support or centering devices are placed. That's why the golden rule, even if it's your divars or even if it's a thermos flask, they should always be kept standing in a vertical position, never ever in a horizontal position, least you compromise the neck fittings. Now standard divars are made or they could be said vacuum flask. They are made of double wall. They are made of double wall borosilicate glass, fully silvered. Now there are different type of cryogenic containers, glass and aluminum, depending upon the cost. And this is very important for your subsequent maintenance of the temperature integrity over an extended period of time. Now these are the characteristics of the metal. So it's a little metallurgical aspect in which the porosity of these metals are taken into consideration. What we call it as PPI pores per square inch, even in a thing like a metal. Because this porosity will depend or is directly proportional to the transfer of heat from one extreme to the another. It's just like a semi-permeable membrane. Now, we peep into a dissected divide. What we find is the upper loose support lid, the very crucial area, the neck. Why crucial? Because remember, the inner chamber is just fused at the neck part. The complete area over here is not at all in any contact or in any communication with the metallic steel. So this C will be the outer body. Then this is the neck core tube. There is a locking slot. Then over here are the canister accommodating grooves. This is the main heart, the cryo chamber. The spiders at the bottom, which will accommodate the canister slot. Then over here, we always see a small blob like thing. This is a vacuum insulation seal. And peripherally here extra, they can give you reinforced either cork insulation or some material which is a very poor or a bad conductor of heat. So what will be the characteristic of a cryo can? A characteristic of a good, well-maintained divar is the capacity to hold liquid nitrogen for a maximum amount of time as possible. 
find or what we hold what we say is as a static hold time or what is the minimal evaporation rate now don't be under the uh, misnomer that once you put the neck core tube on the top your evaporation is going to be negligible no this is always like an exothermic reaction taking place because of the peripheral heat the liquid nitrogen will always keep on evaporating to a certain extent so that's the reason what we are doing is routine topping up of the cryo cans after every four or five days depending upon the way we use them now this is called as the holding time now what is holding time now holding time is capacity in an ideal condition 1 liter the holding time should be 24 hours 2 liter see now the greater the amount of the liquid the more and the longer will be the holding time now if you are using a dewar which is stainless steel or no glass then we find the drop in the efficiency compared to a good glass dewars which is absolutely which is a little costly now the holding time may differ according to the lower or high temperature whether the lid is removed once or repeatedly to check the samples whether the contents are removed mixed checked etc etc so they need a single person meticulous hand now this is of course from a standardized table the bigger the cans the more the liquid content the less will be the evaporation the smaller the container the less the cryo gas the higher the evaporation rate now have a special material which can withstand super cooling otherwise a plain material can easily crack so what do they do the dewars must be kept covered with a loose fitting cap to prevent air or moisture from entering the container and also the subsequent release a continuous monitored subsequent release prevents the pressure from building up and thereby enhancing the safety now many a times we have seen that we take it out there is a slight bit of a film of ice formation into the grooves of this neck core tube once we use our wet hands or subsequently we just expose them to some water this suddenly will crystallize the ice and it will be very difficult for you to push in the neck core tube thereby compromising the holding time of your cryo can and you will be aghast to see that your cylinder gets empty within 2 to 3 days as against the 4 to 5 days naturally which was utilized now this is basically the principle of our topping now hazards in handling please it's extremely useful it preserves life it gives a fantastic recovery of course provided the gametes are handled properly it splashes causes frost bites cryogenic burns if spilled extensively in a small confined place it can kill you do non toxic but on contact with skin can be disastrous delicate tissues like the retina the sclera of the eye with a sudden exposure can also be a disaster frost bite excessive inhalation so please treat it with respect precautions maintain safe distance boiling and splashing will occur when a warm cylinder or a warm container is suddenly charged by putting in hot objects at room temperature like if there is a cryo can you suddenly put in a new canister you put in there is a whoosh of vapor a spurt and you are standing above it finish your eyes are gone it's compromising your eyes please try to see that any container or any warm object metallic object if placed in the dewar is first cooled when you pour from one container to another be careful avoid spattering 
in case of mega containers with more than 100 liter capacity use a discharge tube or a delivery tube which is vacuum operated and any unprotected part of the body should never be allowed to touch uninsulated pipes or vessels which are at minus 90 because they will rip the skin and the flesh out god forbid if something happens don't panic delicately pour warm water and try to loosen the contact between the skin and that delivery tube. Cold metal can stick and tear the flesh as I just discussed. So liquefied gases must be transported in suitably insulated containers. Never completely plug the outlet. Pour the liquid slowly and use your discharge tube. This is what I just told you. First aid. The treatment of frostbite involves rewarming or complete immersion of the frostbitten part for 20 minutes or more in warm water. Don't make it excessively hot, otherwise there will be a contra-heating effect. I splash, rinse continuously for 15 minutes. Please use tepid water. Don't use hot water. Cover the part with bulk sterile dressing because this part, once the outer layer of the epidermis rips off, it is more prone to infection. If there is a severity, please casualty department. Store all of them in an upright condition, well ventilated areas. Avoid dropping, rolling on tipping. Nowadays we have got the lovely trolleys available as per the diameter of the base. So you don't need to drag them. You can delicately pull them across. Pressure build up. Be careful. Excessive liquid nitrogen droppage in a small confined room. Be careful. Prevent extra concentration in an enclosed room. Be careful. Always have an exhaust or a window. Never keep your cryo cans in a room lock, sealed, and surrender. Worse comes to worse, if there is a mega cryo facility, it is better to use oxygen level detector. Monitor. We use low alarm systems because as the tank capacity increases, the net diameter increases. When the net diameter increases, there is more chance of us inserting or putting in electronic devices for alarms and liquid levels. Measure the liquid levels. There are thermocouples available. There are lots of data which can be monitored on your cell phone. Automatic recording systems, audible, visible remote alarms are there. Because remember, a damage done is a permanent damage. And a damage done to one vial or one sample in a canister is good for 100 vials put together at the same time. Now, these are the systems of monitoring system. Liquid level container. As the level drops, and automatically, the valve charges the storage can, so your container is automatically filled in. Or just a detection. This is an audible audio alarm when the critical threshold is dropped. Now, remember, these sensitivities of these units are also very specific. If they are suspended in a vapor phase just above the liquid nitrogen, they might still be resistant. But the, the distance increasing, the temperature dropping, the audibility is always perfect. Now, how will you check your new device? Suppose you get it. First, never bang the container. Always container should be kept in a straight position. You must be knowing it is a lovely thermocol. What you call it as packing. Check the intactness. See that vacuum plug seal is always tight. If it's a little bit loose, it is compromised. Then as we just check the tire pressure on big trucks by just thumping a steel rod and we get that boink effect, you just tap the side of the container to see that reverberating noise. If there is a dull dead echo, that means the vacuum is compromised. Check the canisters in the slots and see that the neck core tube fits properly. This will ensure that the canisters are properly fitted into the spiders of the base. 
Now is the time to charge the liquid nitrogen. Remember, the new canister is hot. Liquid nitrogen, which will be poured in minus 197. So there is going to be an instant boiling and vaporizing of the poured liquid nitrogen. Keep your head away from the vapors of boiling nitrogen. It will take twice the capacity of the DVAR, which is going to be charged because you pour it evaporates, you pour you evaporates. Pour it till the brim, let it settle down, keep the deep filled DVAR for at least 24 hours and then check the reduction in the nitrogen level the next day. Use that dipstick. Moderate reduction is tolerable, but a large reduction means it's a faulty DVAR. If the outer metal body shows super cooling and there are droplets of water, <coughs> excuse me, accommodated on the top, means the DVAR is faulty, the vacuum has gone out, liquid nitrogen is cooling the metallic part, the metallic body has become super cool and the atmospheric air has condensed into droplets. So in such cases, it is better get the DVAR changed. Can they explode? Oh yes, they can. Only store liquid nitrogen in containers with loose fitting neck core tubes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a, a sealed container will build Dr. up Kesey, pressure. Yeah. Uh, can we just uh, wind up? Actually, there is other uh, uh, this thing uh, has to come up. So well, I think uh, that means we took up a lot of time in the prior yes, session. Yes, sir. Anyway, yes, anyway, little bit anyway I, 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 I'll, I'll go a little fast. I'll go yeah, a little fast. Yeah, yeah please. So what is the tanks can explode if the ice, uh, if the pressure increases. So make sure that no ice accumulates. Allow the divas for the gas to escape continuously. Now, this is what happens in case of a liquid nitrogen bomb. The gases are compressed. It is too much. There is no exert pressure. So ultimately, these canisters will explode. Now, why do cryo vials explode? Well, they do. If the necks are not proper, there are two types. There is an internal thread. There is an external thread. Nitrogen will enter inside, you dip it, you take them out, put it into warm water for thawing, expansion takes place, the vial explodes. Now, therefore, please select a good vial, internal thread with silicone washer. Now, there are two types of bottoms, freestanding and the round bottom. So this capacity of the O-ring, it ensures that it is perfect pressure or it is perfect impermeable to the liquid nitrogen from outside to inside. Now, most important is a Linden frost effect. We have found droplets rolling when liquid nitrogen is poured. That is a good nature's way of saving us by an accidental spill on our skin. Because when there is liquid nitrogen due to a sudden temperature, there is a slight 0.2 millimeter of a layer developing in between. Now this prevents the absolute contact. But once this hot surface becomes cool, automatically it will cause a burn. So this Linden frost effect is very important in case of a sudden immersion into liquid nitrogen or a sudden splash up anywhere. Well, tank cleaning, it's very important, but how many of us do? There are lots of things which accidentally spill in broken vials, straws, many holders, the increase, the contamination increases. There have been assessment of carrier contamination. In no wash canisters, there have been 74% of contamination detected and in a sterile wash container, there have been absolutely 300%. There are many dilute bleaches available to clean the interiors of the tanks. Well, nitrogen is contaminated by a number of reasons. And please, AIDS virus, the more the cooler, the more happily it survives. So please, always when you freeze these vials, it's a separate divar. Okay? Because long-term cryobanking can have a potential risk of contamination as well as cross-contamination. This is a rinsing method. Now, since I'm short of time, I'll have to rush it a little bit. Now, cryoprotection. Well, you have to have gloves, aprons, and masks. Because please see that none of the part of your skin gets exposed. You wear your shoes and socks, remove them. Don't wear socks, which will trap the liquid nitrogen and further cause you cryoburns. Because they will be absorbed very easily. Cryo accessories you have got by the tons in a con small room, expiation causes. So you have to determine the volume of your room with the content of the nitrogen, which can displace the oxygen out. Because if less than 20% oxygen is displaced, there is a chance of asphyxiation. 
there are different stages what happens when you get claustrophobic if two or three persons are in a small cry room and there is a lot of spillage many a times we have recorded uneasiness restlessness headaches so these are all the reasons first stage in case of anoxia no supply of oxygen compared to hypoxia where the oxygen is comparatively less so well these are the things which can happen to an individual and this is how we have to prevent it areas so we studied all the things personal equipment asphyxiation concern pressurization hazards but still a successful cryo means these things have to be intact because remember even a thawed sperm with lovely moments can still infertilize a fantastic blastocystone recovery can still not give you a pregnancy there can be progression errors there can be implantation because we don't have the eyesight to look into what the interiors are a thawed substance may look fantastic beautiful be better last time to a dollar that this is going to give you a pregnancy only to be disappointed at the last minute so don't get carried away by these shows please so a word of precaution divers is not a magical hat it's my last slide divers is not a magical hat nor is liquid nitrogen a magical elixir it all depends upon the quality of stuff cryo protectants use knowledge and the skill if you freeze garbage in you get garbage out and remember a poor bookman will always blame the students so let us not make a simple thing a complicated issue that my cryo was not perfect i think so with this i end my talk unfortunately i had to rush quite a few of my slides because of supposedly lack of time okay thank uh, you uh, thank you dr kersi it was a uh, fantastic nice elaborate and um, uh, very informative uh, talk and i feel that a whole day is uh, insufficient, not sufficient for uh, describing this so many things i myself have learned first time i have seen and i was having so many questions related with this why because why this uh, container has to be stand keep in a standing position why there is a nice formation and so many other questions which is automatically well elaborated and well answered in your this talk so as we are running short of time so we'll have the question answer session or maybe they can uh, if someone has question they can directly communicate with dr kirsi so uh, with this we end this talk and uh, hand over to uh, sanket thank you thank you so much charu sir and uh, thank you so much kashi sir for that wonderful elaborative uh, lecture on uh, safety of uh, or handling during cryo preservation and uh, rahul are you there yeah yeah yes thank you yeah i'll be sharing the screen so i would like yeah, to uh, request you to introduce our next moderator for the panel yeah yes uh, so on behalf of aira i would like to thank Uh, thank you uh, to the speakers and uh, the moderators of the previous session and to begin with the next session which is a panel discussion and for that panel discussion i would like to introduce the moderator of our session uh, first to come is dr vijay mangoli sir sir is a very renowned person in the indian embryology he has been associated with human ivf since 1986 and sir has uh, many publications in uh, peer reviewed journals uh, has done presentations in national and international conferences and major contributions in medical reference uh, books sir is also a recipient of lifetime achievement award in uh, 2017 next slide please uh, next to go is uh, a very dear friend of mine dr nisha chimote He is the chief and consultant embryologist in uh, various centers of Nagpur, practicing embryology for more than eighteen years. He is also joint secretary for IFS uh, Vidarbha chapter, executive committee member for ISAR uh, for the year twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty two. He has also contributed chapters uh, in various books. Uh, he has been representing India at Ashray since. 2012 and has also the name of uh, producing first pgd uh, uh, baby through single embryo transfer over to you nisha and uh, mangal sir right that thank you for a wonderful uh, introduction uh, rahul uh, i would like to share my screen first sure, i'll be copying my uh, yeah 
Yeah, sir. Yeah. One second, sir. I'll just stop my screen. Yes, sir. You're free to go. Right. Uh, I hope it is visible. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. It's visible. Yes. Just make it full screen, Nisha. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, so let us begin with our panel discussion. So wonderful to have uh, Vijay sir with me uh, as a moderator. And uh, let us begin this uh, panel. Our first uh, panelist is Dr. Srikant Yatnale. He's quite an experienced uh, embryologist and well known within our circuit. Uh, he's uh, been uh, national and international faculties at various conferences and done a lot of uh, practical workshops and trained many, many embryologists. He's also been the executive member of ACE. The next speaker, uh, panelist that we are having is Dr. Uh, Dr. Bhasheen, Nirmal Bhasheen, and uh, she's the director and clinical embryologist founder at Janine Fertility Center. Uh, she has a lot of, she's members of all the organizations here and has more than 20 years of experience. Then we have our third panelist, and that is Dr. Saili Kandari, a dear friend of mine. Uh, she has done her PhD in reproductive biology. She's a wonderful, voracious speaker. And uh, she has uh, produced a lot of papers, international publications, as well as represented India at HRA and ASRM. The next panelist is uh, Durai. Uh, he's a chief embryologist at Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences. He's more than 15 years of experience in clinical embryology, and he visits uh, West Africa. Uh, he's also executive member of ACE, as well as received Best Embryologist Award for Mercedes-Benz Health Summit 2019. Last, uh, then we've got uh, Shamshi Ali. Uh, he is currently holding the position of Lab Manager at Life Infertility Multispeciality Hospital, Kerala. He's done uh, presentations at national and international levels at conferences. He's also faculty of uh, various academic parts of OSS centers and guest lecturer at National College. His core work is in uh, oocyte vitrification and blastocyst mm -hmm. biopsy. Currently, continuing his research study in influence of paternal age effects in ICSI outcome of donor sites. Last but not, not the least, we have Falguni Patro, who's a senior embryologist and scientific director at Odisha Fertility Center. He's the chief embryologist at Rainbow Hospital, Hyderabad. So let us begin uh, with our panel. Uh, I hand on to uh, Vijay sir for the first question. Thank you, Rijat. And it is really, I'm, I'm very, very delighted to be here as a part of this uh, IHERA uh, webinar that, that is conducted excellently with uh, great speakers, knowledgeable speakers. And we just heard two uh, such great speakers uh, and that contributed uh, very much you know, essential and necessary knowledge to the whole um, listeners. Uh, coming to this panel, now, although it is it is meant that we have given the title that it is the basics of vitrification, this is one of the most important aspects as far as the cryopreservation is concerned. <clears throat> and we should know many things you know, that uh, may affect the outcome of uh, vitrification. Yeah, no problem now. So uh, to begin with, uh, Dr. Saili, uh, very welcome. And I, will I would like to start with you. now. To give a little bit of background before directly jumping on to the uh, vitrification, can you please elaborate some part of the you know cryopreservation methods that we used to use it before switching over to the uh, vitrification and how effective they were? Sally, can you hear me? Sally, you, you're mute. Saili, can you unmute Yami. yourself? Yami. I think there is Saili some the connection problem, I think. Yes. She is not on mute. Can we properly? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Yeah, unmute, unmute yourself. Yes, Saili, you got the question? Uh, so, Dr. Vijay, could you? Yes. You are, you are, you are muted yourself. Just unmute. I'll repeat the question. Did you get the question? We can't hear you still. No, we can't hear you still. No, we can't hear you still. If the moderator uh, Dr. Can Sally, you. please unmute yourself. You have muted yourself. Now, yeah, yeah. Now, now can you hear me? Yeah, yes, now, now we can hear you. 
So okay. please, please Sorry. give a little bit background. Please give a little bit background about different color preservation methods we used to use it in ARTs. Okay, so I'm going to keep it brief because the history is quite wide. It starts from 1776 when Spallanzani was the first to study that sub-zero temperatures can be used to freeze silkworm eggs and stallion semen. So then coming to 1938, when they were searching for a remedy for syphilis, they found that actually sperm that was pulled at minus 80, which was vapor freezing, really works. And after 40 days, if they're thawed, they can regain their motility. So this is like really, really back in the 1780s to 1800s and coming to 1900s. So when we talk about vitrification or when we talk about slow freezing, so this is a slide on slow freezing. So we'll go to slow freezing first. So in the beginning, vitrification was given up of the crab protectants and uh, it ended, we ended up going for slow freezing. Right, one second. So, so Parks et al. in 1946 was the first person who accidentally saw the Sorry, you noted again. Sorry, again, you lost the, some problem with the connection. Yes, uh, doctor, I think it's getting muted by itself. There is some issue. Uh, yeah. Sorry for the same. Yeah, no so uh, in 1945, Parkes accidentally discovered that if you have a lower rate of cooling, the way you had in slower freezing, you're able to freeze semen for longer period of time. And then it was later on Chang who was able to freeze rabbit over in the uh, 1980s and was able to give the first rabbit uh, light books. After that, we know the history that Peter Mazur uh, knew about uh, these stages and how they ended up going to vitrification. So I think we need to move to vitrification now. Uh, Nisha, next slide. So uh, the difference between slow freezing and vitrification we have just mentioned is the rate of cooling and the rate of warming as well. So uh, vitrification for the first time, so Peter Mazur in 1980s was able to uh, figure out that if you create a cocktail, of cryoprotectants, then you'll be able to use vitrification to give improved uh, results when it comes to gametes, oocytes, and embryos. And the Mazur, the Mazur group and Wilbert group both ended up having the first survival of murine embryos in 1970s after the slow freezing. And later, Peter Mazur himself, there's a baby. Okay. Uh, so, Peter Mazur himself shifted to vitrification. And uh, then we had, we began to get, uh, in 1986, Chen uh, gave twin pregnancies using oocyte vitrification. And as we know, after 2003 till 2008, we had large studies by Anna Koba and Antinori, uh, which led to oocyte vitrification becoming uh, not an experimental technique. And eventually here we are now in the techniques. So this, I'm trying to keep, keep it small. I, I also have other milestones, but this is basically how it began the slow freezing and then moved to vitrification right. after failing in vitrification in the first attempt. Right, so absolutely uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, it is it is very true that we have progressed a lot from the vapor freezing or ice uh, dry ice freezing till vitrification now, and the output have in, in improved uh, to many folds, almost uh, hundred folds that we can get it. Of course, for embryos, still we are struggling with the other cells uh, types. So I would like to know a little bit detail about that. Um, uh, I would like to ask you that what different kinds of cells we need to cryopreserve in uh, ART procedures because it, th there is a need to cryopreserve so many things. So can you please elaborate uh, on this issue? Mrs. Rai, can you, can you come on the line? Please unmute yourself. Hello. Yes. Yeah, I think you are on. Yes, right. yes. Yeah, this, we, we usually in the ARD, we freeze three kinds of uh, uh, cells sperm, uh, These three, the majorly we are routinely practicing in our practice. But actually, we are, the, now recently, we are freezing the ovarian tissue and uh, stem cells also. But the difference between these all two, Technically, they all are stored in the minus 196. 
in the same temperature but the cryoprotectant and technically they might be a small difference between here and there but in if we, when you are freezing the sperm is for sperm we are freezing for the uh, when the time of the process of the male quarter may not be available and uh, some uh, patient is unable to produce at the time of uh, requirement then moreover uh, the pisa samples the biopsy done after that we can we, we avoid more surgery then and then then some of the ongo patient before radiotherapy then ongo therapy we start freezing the spermatozoa the same thing in the oocyte also we are freezing mostly we are freezing for the oncology purpose we are uh, the, which patient we have some some kind of cancer they want to go radiotherapy then before that we will freeze the oocytes nowadays in the oocytes we come into the picture like uh, uh, social freezing so the recently that to be you know apple also they introduced uh, the uh, they, they they allotted some fund their employee the female employee can freeze the oocyte for the future purposes because they want uh, the to grow the carrier before they settle in the life so like that now it is getting more popular most of the celebrities are doing they are uh, freezing the oocyte for the future purposes this are the mostly we are doing in the oocytes the embryo it is embryo when we are coming to the embryo embryo is the play a major role in the field of art recently we moved from fresh embryo to all frozen cycles most of the centers in india now we are now we are practicing the 100% frozen ftt cycles so this that the way the surplus embryos whenever we are doing the uh, regular ivf cycles we may have the surplus embryos after transferring the embryo that embryo can be freeze and remaining Uh, the ohs to avoid the ohs we, we 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 may not transfer we are not able to transfer the embryos in that particular cycle we may freeze all the embryos then we proceed into the later cycle for the donation so to, for to you know, now we are the some of the people they want to donate their uh, zygotes that time also we can use it that frozen and next cycle when the uh, record donor is there that we can do then okay. we are coming to the ovarian tissue the recently that, that is only developed for the Uh, oncology patients who are there to some uh, that oncology uses there to preserve their fertility they want to preserve the ovarian tissue from the ovarian tissue we may get the uh, proper implantation you will get that's in the future and they develop new our cells fine good the yes uh, cells we frozen regularly in, in the stem cell we are normally umbilical cord uh, preserve everyone knows now but these are the three types we are using here in uh, very particularly in the art field okay yes nisha yeah. uh, nisha please yeah. unmute yourself you are on mute doctor please unmute yeah can you hear me now hello yeah. yes yes we can okay right uh, so i think we do have a question like this so i think uh, we should move to the next question this one Which is, I think, you have the slide in front of you. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, Samshi, coming to the uh, principle of vitrification. When we when we talk about the uh, vitrification, we know that we have an excellent modality or uh, and the protocol to you know get maximum output from the cryo preservation. Uh, can you briefly explain us what is the basic principle of uh, vitrification? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We can. Hear. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity so vitrification we all know it's simple and less expensive technique than uh, slow freezing uh, it is basically a glassification technique and we all know in everyday practice we have vitrification in all our labs so the vitrification help us to go for freeze all and it's also helping in achieving slightly better pregnancy than the previous days so talking about the uh, ice ice is the enemy for uh, any cryo position for protocol so compared to slow freezing and vitrification we try to achieve uh, no ice formation uh, in uh, vitrification technique so the basic difference between slow freezing and vitrification is in slow freezing we gradually increase the concentration of cryoprotectant agent and cooling rate but in uh, vitrification we go rapid uh, cool, uh, cooling and also Uh, we are going with the high concentration of 
uh, career protection agent. There are two types of CPA. One is permeable and non-permeable. The latest medias are coming with permeable such as DMSO, ethylene glycol, or non-permeable combined. As the Dr. Sayali mentioned, uh, we have got the cocktail of uh, uh, different cryoprotectant agents which help us to achieve the temperature. Uh, the basic thing is the ice crystal formation. So ice crystal formation happens between incident happen between minus 15 to uh, 140 degrees Celsius during the uh, cryopreservation. So when we are using vitrification, we are actually going into the very rapid freezing, which is minus 23,000 degrees Celsius. So by doing this rapid, we actually can achieve a very good survival rate. Okay. Question? Right. So can we move on to the next question? Yes, yes, Nisha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this question is for Dore. In ART, which cell types needs to be cryopreserved? So, yeah, what are the cell covered. types? Yeah, so I think this has been covered. So, we move on to the next question, I believe. Yeah, all right, okay. So, obviously, we've gone through these. We have gone to the sperm, the oocyte, the embryo, ovarian tissue. So these are the things which have already been discussed. Then, my next question is to Falcone. So, how is it different from slope cooling? So, we are doing already vitrification. So, how do you compare it and what are the differences between these two? Uh, please go ahead, Falcone. Good evening, everybody. Is it audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, fine. Yeah, nowadays, uh, I think most of us are doing uh, vitrification. We are not doing much more of slow freezing. I think few centers are doing. I have a better experience with vitrification. Vitrification provides a high survival rate, minimal deleterious effect on post-warming embryo on your morphology, and it can improve clinical outcomes. And it is a very simple protocol, just two to three drops, or depending on the manufacturer protocol or something, I think four to five type of solution, then directly dip, um, uh, then uh, plunge them, in, uh, then a sift, a sift it to your um, different type of carrier and plunge them into the liquid nitrogen. So it's very easy to do. And as uh, we know uh, right now, some Sir has explained the thing, the, the no ice crystal formation used to be happen, is, um, uh, is made, made, used to eliminate the major factor that can cause cell damage during the slow freezing method. Cells are placed into the cryoprotectant and then plunged directly into the liquid nitrogen and water is largely replaced by the cryoprotectant, the cooling rate and the warming rate, the cooling rate is higher. So it's good and uh, utilize higher concentration of your cryoprotectant that allows shorter exposure time to the cryoprotectant or the cooling rates. And uh, vitrification is an ultra rapid cooling technique that requires a high concentration of cryoprotectant. Therefore, vitrification takes only a few seconds to cool and um, a very few seconds to cool your, uh, cool your uh, embryo or your oocyte and it doesn't require specialized expensive equipment. And with the uh, vitrification, your survival rate is higher your oocyte morphological survival rates are higher, rapid um, vitrification or warming it used or minimizes the osmotic injuries. The cryo injury due to the ice, ice crystal formation or the osmotic effect is reduced by using high concentration of your cryoprotectant and an extremely high rate of cooling. It reduces the time of your cryopreservation procedure because we know vitrification procedure takes very less time compared to slow freezing. Eliminates the cost of expensive uh, programmable of your freezing equipment and save the time also. It's an efficient, fast, and economical. Thank you. Good. I right. think, Thank you. I, think I know nice. that uh, today we fortunately we have Kursi with us, and I know Kursi was once upon a time a diehard fan of the slow freezing. Kursi, <laughs> can I, I, would, I would like to, you know, if, if time permits, then I would like to discuss with you. Sure, that, sir. Uh, yeah, how are you, Kursi? I'm fine, sir. Okay, I would okay. just like a one, one simple question to all the panelists or whosoever is on the program. We are very much in favor of it. Why should we not? Well, we are getting results. We are getting good survival. We are getting good recovery, viability, a little question mark. Take home baby rate. Well, it's still a little question mark. That's besides the point. But I want to know that when you are using a super, super concentration of PROH, is it causing any subsequent toxicity at the cell level? Because we have not yet monitored the effects on the first and the second filial generation down the line. Fine. We'll just now there are there are some papers to it where they have distinctly stated that DMSO in high concentration induces drastic changes in human cellular processes and epigenetic landscape. 
Yes. Now, of course, every technique has its own pluses and minuses, but yes. that doesn't make one technique a total foolproof and give a blanket of I protection know, to it from all the other things. I know. Darcy, I think first, let us yes. finish off the uh, you know uh, basic questions, and then we will go back to the sure, uh, sure. part of it. Yeah. Okay, Nisha, the, the next question, please. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, Srikanth coming to you. Welcome. Now, what are the different types of cryoprotectants? I think you will be able to give part of the answer that uh, Kursi asked you, why we are using particular type of cryoprotectants and what is the advantage of this and what is the disadvantage of those? Srikanth. Srikanth, can you hear me? Did you get the question? Sorry, I was I am not on mute. Sorry, hope uh, everybody can listen. Yes, yes we can. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. coming back, like when we actually started cryopreservation with the slow freezing, the concentration of the cryoprotectants were less, and it was a gradual uh, dehydration of the cell where the chances of forming of the ice crystal was more. Okay. So now with the high concentration, with the so many years of studies and all. The cryoproteins like DMSO, ethylene glycol, uh, FICOL, sucrose, glucose. See, these all things, like there are some permeable and non permeable. Permeable, what actually happens at the cellular level that we have to see? The gradual removal or gradual dehydration, there is a chance of ice nucleation. What is an actual uh, fear of having damage to the cell, I believe? So it will be the slower formation of ice nucleation. So that has to be, it is heterogeneous, like uh, gradual it happens. So it has to be sudden, which stops it and removes everything. That is, which is actual by this uh, DMSO and thing I call combination or cocktail, what we can say. And then using the sucrose by, by solidifying at a homogeneous glass formation where this temperature fall down is rapid. So there is no chance of ice crystallization at all. So that is how it actually works. And during warming, you, you with the higher concentration of sucrose, then gradually coming to one molar, then 0.5 molar. So everything slowly we exposed to that, that gushing of uh, the uh, heptis buffered media, what the base media is used, that rehydrates the cell and again achieves the same uh, consistency or the structure wherein the organelles are not damaged at all. Hope I am... Uh, I will explain it like Hello? So you are muted. Vijay sir, you are muted. No, we can't hear can, can, Yeah, he is, he is muted. He is we muted. Can't hear you. Somebody, somebody unmute him. Okay. Uh, uh, that's it. That's it. Okay. Um, Dr. Vijay, we could not hear you a bit. Yeah, yeah, right. Can, can you hear now? Yeah. Okay, fine. Fine. Nishal, coming to the next point, I think we have taken a little bit of mistakenly critical steps in warming first. I would like to go for the, shall we, shall we cover the warming first or we will go for the uh, cooling first? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, just... Okay, yeah. just, just cooling, go the cooling, cooling first, first. Only one point, I can I add one point? Ah, yes. Yeah, so also what I, I, I wanted to learn more, what actually, see, forming of crystal, of removing of water, that, that what, what actually, how it happens, that what I tried to, this thing. So this ethylene glycol and they form this phospholipid tri, uh, bilayer, or the, this thing is there, the um, uh, zonas or uh, layer of the cell. Okay, so that bilayer, it, it is in a liquid form or the uh, soft form. So it crystallizes that, that and that uh, helps in gushing of or exchange of uh, removing de dehydration fast. Okay, that, fine. That works. Fine, fair enough. Right. Now, Nisha, can you please cover right. this? Okay. So, yes, I'll take, yeah. So let us move on to the next question. Uh, this one is again for the right. Um, what are the critical steps in cooling? If you can elaborate, uh, let us begin with that. Do right, do we have you here? Is Durai there? Yes, I hope. 
uh, the vitrification process is recently developed the major part how fast it get cooling and how fast it get thawing these two parts it is the major the for your survival rate of the, the hammers and thrusts here in in the cooling the timing is the major criteria how much time you are exposing to the media in in the freezing in that that uh, called uh, cryo predictance if you are uh, not uh, exposing in the right time in the right solution it will be the that is the one point you should to consider and the second one the selection of the embryos are the oocytes or the sperm if your selection is not right if you are selecting the grade 3 or grade uh, it is the bc embryos in the blastocyst it may not survive we, we may not blame the technique that is one of the critical point you have to select the right embryo and you have to follow the right timing and third one is in the you have to be very careful in the last solution everyone may, may know it is so viscous because of the holding in the right cryola because why it is more viscous means it will hold very easily in the cryola it may not fall down when you are uh, changing the position up and down it may go very easily and more viscous viscosity it may when you are putting the embryo it may be uh, float up and it will stay upside so you have to be very careful that that we should not uh, waste the time to find out the embryo in the viscous solution and we have to fix in the Uh, right place and keep it in the uh, liquid nitrogen at the right time and we have to close if it is a closed device there is also we have we have two devices one is a closed system and is a open systems so now it is more important previously we may not consider open or closed now during this covid era we are more considering about the closed system maybe if it's a better it may contamination it may happen or not is all the discussions are go, it's going on still now maybe my wingo uh, that vijay sir and nizad we have to conclude how it can help any that the closed system or open system may help us in the uh, the covid transition we will discuss that i think no sure we will do it but what but what Most yeah but what happened been... when we are uh, now what is the issue now we are freezing after four five days the patient becoming positive so that's why the closed system yeah. if it is help we can move on these are the three four points i feel right. it's very uh, critical points in cooling point of view the right. time point will be you cover up later yeah right right you have nicely right. covered right. it uh, roy and uh, there are still questions we will we'll definitely cover it uh, we'll cover this part back. of it yeah okay. one point that we can add to this is ha huh. yeah. yeah one point i would like to add to this is that while you have loaded your embryo with the vs solution and when you're dipping it into the liquid nitrogen because of the leiden frost reaction you have to make sure that you stir it vigorously so that immediate cooling can happen just dipping it will not help so that is small tip that make a lot of difference yeah right. so let us move on to the next question uh, can i can you go a little bit back yes, uh, the, yeah, so, yeah right so it's all yours yes now yeah. i would like to invite uh, dr nirmal dr nirmal welcome uh, can you please elaborate part of the critical steps involved in the warming because it is said that in vitrification rather than cooling or equal to the cooling warming is a most critical step that actually decides the outcome of vitrification uh, dr nirmal please yeah am i audible yes 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 you are the first step which is very important that the thawing solution should be at 37 degrees and it should be calibrated for at least 1 hour prior to starting the thawing procedure because uh, the spindle recovery is supposed to be uh, very uh, fast when the temperature is at 37 degree hmm. and we the second step what i have noticed in my practical experience that carefully identifying the straws is very important because what happens when there is vapor you can't even read properly you just have to for example there are two gurpreets there are very common names in punjab and how do you identify so what i do i open the cap plunged in the liquid nitrogen i take out the cap the straw with the embryos is still in the liquid nitrogen i take out the cap read it properly identify it with the id number match the number of embryos everything and then plunge the straw into the uh, thawing solution and uh, th there should be no air exposure at all what we have seen that the uh, the faster the embryo reaches the thawing solution the better is the recovery rate That, that example i always give that the embryo should not have that fear reaction the embryo should not be aware what's happening catch the embryo by surprise so uh, then plunging time in th thawing solution that i already covered that less than a second and it should be under continuous vision because that's the point where we tend to lose our embryos so when you are continuously seeing the embryos you can track them 
on spot and at least 170 micron stripper is uh, recommended at least on a day 3 embryo uh, because uh, we can see degeneration or collapsing of the blastomeres if we use a smaller uh, diameter and uh, the uh, ds and ws are at room temperature that is what is the protocol and we should follow the protocol strictly and the timeline of the medium whichever medium we are using and while shifting embryos from one droplet to another we have to first beforehand take uh, calibrate the stripper take a few drops from the next uh, drop and uh, a few mi uh, milliliters from the next droplet and then load the embryos from the previous droplet so that there is a let lesser shock to the embryo and uh, for evaluating the survival the we have to culture the embryos in a pre warmed cleavage media for at least 2 hours because immediately you can't uh, interpret the quality and the survival of the embryo you need at least 2 hours incubation to see the embryos again and our aim is to achieve maximum survival and better implantation rate right that is true two points just i want to add it here is one is uh, as you rightly mentioned that the identification of the straws is very important very crucial but at the same time you you have to be sure that you don't cause what is the phenomena called as cell cracking because while um, you know checking the name of the patient and counter checking by your colleague it should never happen that that embryo remains into even the in the in the vapor phase for longer than half a minute or so it yeah yeah should that, be always yes. dipped within within the, within, within uh, it has to be done very strictly yes correct and second important thing is always take a pas uh, a a pipette slightly larger than what you anticipate the growth will be because although the embryos are shrunken and at the time of uh, you know freezing part of it but still as as you you know go on different stages of warming they will regain their size and that's why you have to take a little bit more at this stage they are absolutely very very fragile and you just cannot afford to squeeze them by any means by taking a smaller pipette uh, that is that is another thing so thank, thank you very much to, for covering these crucial uh, aspects uh, nishad what is can you move to the next one right so i have a question for samshir now uh, so samshir tell me what are the common mistakes during vitrification warming and how do we avoid them a uh, common mistake is anything going uh, uh, not following sop is i think it's a common mistake and uh, it starts from uh, let's go in a chronological way when you start freezing vitrification i think the basic thing you have to do is the proper marking of your cryo devices preparing your sheets and uh, the properly maintaining your uh, dishes which media you are using are you aware of which uh, the media's instructions are you following their instruction are you uh, making the media in the room temperature are you making a proper size uh, you know drop size i often see people uh, some some of my colleagues were started doing 10 dishes at one time the, with a drop on because the last dish when you use it it almost more than 20 to 30 minutes that started dry off i always recommend i always recommend personally to have a four well lunk or we are getting that uh, six well kaya type of dishes and make whichever you want make a bigger drop size so in that way we can avoid a second thing is keeping a proper timer don't put all the embryos in one one shot because the first embryo when you are taking it you might take it at 12 minutes the last embryo might come at 18th minute so that proper keeping timer for every embryo is most important and you should have a second witness person which dish you are taking uh, make sure he is telling the name loudly so you can hear it so you can avoid mistakes and make sure which embryo you are freezing in which cryo lock or cryo top whatever the device which you are using uh, number it properly so you can make sure which embryo you are going to thaw and secondly how many numbers of embryos you are going to keep either day day 3 or day 5 how many numbers two uh, or one i personally prefer to freeze uh, not, not more than two one or two if it is blastocyst i used to freeze only single so because of the cost cutting may it may go to two also sometimes so make sure which grade of embryo you are keeping in which cryo lock and you have to make sure your junior or somebody is writing it and uh, and while uh, freezing i think the loading volume is most important as we have discussed before the conduction of temperature is more important for the embryo survival and plunge it as nishad has mentioned stir it properly to get good survival rate and keep it in a different goblet for every patient you, you have to make separate goblet don't mix it mix up and keep it in you know one goblet like that 
and make sure you are marking with the patient name id whatever the lab id you have so that is for verification and when you are keeping in the tank also make sure you are which tank you are uh, keeping it and document it i think document is the most most important step in verification and warming so always uh, have a person like uh, junior and make sure he is keeping it a bit quick because i see sometimes they just take it up and they'll slowly plunge it inside when there is no space that is one thing and coming to the warming again uh, the warming temperature as uh, dr nirmal has mentioned we have to properly keep the ts solution 37 degree celsius as most companies recommending nowadays and we have to keep at least an hour prayer that is the recommendable and when you are thawing the embryo uh, one of my colleague i re- i have noticed uh, who has joined us newly he was checking the he was he has taken the cryo lock out he is checking the name then he is opening the cap and then only he kept it in the 1 ml solution you already lost a lot uh, much time there it's supposed to be less than 1 minute because the uh, the, uh, the it should be very it is very fast uh, temperature conduction happened there so you have to open the cap inside the liquid nitrogen uh, whatever you want to check name goblet everything you check it inside the liquid nitrogen remove the cover inside then you keep it uh, it should be less than 1 minute so you have to follow whatever the instruction nice. given by the company Uh, so and and last uh, main thing is if it is a high risk patient or hiv hepatitis b please please prefer separate tanks and also check your survival rate of every month make a sheet pull the sheet out and check what is your survival rate and pregnancy rate if it, anything is i think nowadays is commercial media we are achieving almost 90 to 95% survival rate so anything less than that uh, i think we should uh, check technical side or any other sop right right okay wonderful so it's very nicely explain all of the points one take home message is don't put in too many straws in one goblet you can just have one goblet exactly. for patient so that the yes, confusion yes. is less and there is no mix and match so let us move ahead with the next question yeah just a moment please unmute please unmute we can't hear you Vijay sir, we cannot hear no, you. Sorry, sorry. Now yeah. coming to the next part of it, many many questions, many many people in many conferences they are asked this question about the efficacy between uh, comparison between the open and the closed system. So, Ekant, do you have any experience? Which system do you use, and why? Uh, regularly, I've been using the open system only hmm. because uh, very rarely I have only thought I I am not to practice that closed. system type uh, to be very honest i would say mm-hmm. but uh, what happens exactly in open and uh, closed is there is a direct contact between the media which is holding that tissue or the uh, embryo with that liquid nitrogen and, and as kc was insisting or uh, this thing uh, mentioning the cross contamination is at the highest when the open system is there with this hbg support to hiv positive now this new corona has come we don't know what actually corona is there it's a carrying or not or virus is going to the so cross contamination is the first and foremost uh, problem and the fear where we use the open system in closed system we avoid that but handling of the equipment with the closed system taking time and that is little tedious what i have experienced personally also while thawing i have no more experience in closed system but open system is very easy fast and you get a direct cooling what the cooling of minus 15000 to 30000 what we expect in vitrification is achieved in open system than in closed system so closed system it requires more concentration of uh cryoprotectin but uh, it's, it's it's not that fast uh, they they do say ki you have to put some i have seen different different devices but it is not direct achievement of that sudden and fast temperature is there that okay. is the problem and few papers which mention there is no difference at all uh, with the pregnancy rate hardly 2% or 1% so it's not significant at all right i would like to put this question to all the panelists how many of the panelists they use the closed system all the panelists so, please so we have used closed system you have closed system in the first case hello can see and mute wait go ahead sally yeah so we have used closed system in the past uh, mainly the uh, the rapid uh, i 
by uh, so the rapid eye with the okay. vitro life unit yeah so we had used that for blastocyst tracings and it they used oh, to work okay. as well yeah yeah okay anyone anyone else using closed system apart from me i have been using closed system for last around 7 years mm -hmm. oh more than that maybe <laughs> and i use only uh, closed system right but uh, so i i believe sir that um, closed system versus open system is like uh, pepsi versus coke I, oh. Both are good. It depends so, on what you like. Uh, it will give you result. What is so your last flavor? Last four years, I am also using closed system. Okay. Yeah. So I don't feel any uh, differences in between that uh, closed system and open system. Yeah. Good. So there, I used to use that open system, but uh, suddenly I uh, got some infection uh, in the system. That's why I switch over to Three closed two, system. Two. Okay. So now totally closed system. I am using totally closed system. Nothing. Fine. Good. Great. Someone is with me. Thanks. <laughs> and there was one more, uh, one more experience that we had used uh, closed system for oocyte vitrifications uh, in 2013 to 2015, and we were fine with it. We yeah, yeah, yeah. did not yeah. face any issues yeah, as such. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So I think Process it is just a matter of practice and little yeah. bit of development. But once you are used to yeah. it, the closed system is equally as good as the uh, the systems. Uh, can we move to move to the uh, yes. next question, Nisha? Okay, right. so basically, I think we had covered uh, this part of it, but a little bit, Doctor Nirmal, can you brief uh, into the basic advantages of uh, vitrification when we talk it? When we are talking about the vitrification as the main topic today, can you brief it that what are yeah, the basic yeah. uh, vitrif yeah, advantages? Sure. Uh, the first step, the first and the most important step is there is elimination of ice crystal formation, and uh, the speed of the process minimizes the exposure of embryo outside the incubator so vitrification is very rapid so we spend lesser time and the embryo is not exposed and it is very cost effective you don't need that infrastructure and the coolers absolutely so this is very very cost effective and time time has a little it's very rapid and it increases the efficiency of the embryologist you can do so many vitrifications in a day otherwise slow absolutely. cooling was Absolutely. very time consuming yeah, we have been doing it waiting for four, four hours for one single swap yeah that that's very tedious correct and the next next question is uh, nisha yeah okay so uh, my question is to falguni so what are the limitations of vitrification we have talked about the advantages let us go on the other side now yeah is uh, thank you is we have all know ki all procedure all the techniques are having some uh, advantage and some of the limitation also and the vitrification process few limitation of my experience that i would like to say the craft protect and toxicity then the speed of the form uh, the speed of the cooling and uh, warming rate the effect of the dissolved sub substances then the concentration and type of cpa and the temperature of exposure and one thing is that whenever is we are all know this is a covid period and uh, the contamination part your embryo used to come to a di direct contact with the liquid nitrogen so it is all is a risk then how much is the proficiency or the skill of the operator who is going to do it it, it also depend on it in how fast in your es uh, solution or in the vs then uh, from your vs to your uh, liquid nitrogen with the minimal amount of the volume so it's depend on the speed and the yes. speed of the temperature changes while keeping the concentration of the craft protectant as low as possible and in turn determined by the cells permeability coefficient it's the surface area and the osmotic gradient between the outside and the inside so i think these are the few points that we have to and these are the limitation of the vitrification i think in uh, as uh, 2015 or 16 around that time when it was at indo uh, i think um, uh, me and um, uh, uh, dr jafar ali we have a, and i think the saeli was a, so was there we we had a discussion of around 45 minute to 1 hour regarding the limitation of the vitrification part and few of the cryo protectant so few points i have noted that i have said here thank you okay. right all right wonderfully done wonderfully explained all the points uh, so we'll move on to the next question now right uh, so i believe this is the last question of our panel discussion and this goes to saeli Sai, what is the future of cryopreservation in ART? Could you elaborate? Right. Do we have to so basically yeah. the. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Me? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Vegan. Yeah. Okay. 
So basically, the future of prior preservation A is very bright because as we know, vitrification has really been a game changer. Uh, the first thing is uh, automated vitrification is going to come to the IVF center near you very, uh, very soon. Although in India, I mean, I, I'm talking about the next decade or so. So we'll probably have right. auto tagging, barcode tagging of uh, straws, which we are already seeing with few uh, cryopreservation. We bought uh, something called a cryogat right now available. Yes, uh, yes. So, so we already have a cryogat yeah. in the, uh, you know, in, in the market that you can yes. tag your particular straw. But then there is also, uh, there is also the research going on on tagging individual embryos. So maybe yes, that right. would also come in the future. Uh, we already have the Gavi and the fertility safe uh, automated vitrification products that are open in few markets, although not yet in India. So uh, these, uh, this, uh, especially for a very busy laboratories or for oocyte banks who are doing large numbers of vitrification, these gadgets would probably, uh, you know, in the long run, make much more sense, probably reduce the cost right. of doing vitrification. Not in the beginning, although they will be expensive in the beginning, uh, probably in the long run, uh, that would really help. I mean, if you yes, look there at are it, other it, it research goes... programs that are going on. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Yes, yeah, so, the, so I, I'll try to wind it up quick, quicker. Yeah, so then yeah. there are research programs going on uh, in, in Japan, China on using liquid helium versus liquid nitrogen because they have seen there is a higher retrieval, better flocculation <laughs> compared to even uh, normal press cycles when you use liquid helium, probably because it's less uh, you know, it's a less uh, it tends to vaporize less than liquid nitrogen, and uh, so the third that we were talking about, uh, you know, the situation of viruses and bacteria and currently COVID, which is really really bad, and uh, we are just trying to go through it. So if we want to keep our patients safe, uh, eventually we will have to think about filtering liquid nitrogen and trying to avoid infection, contamination, use closed systems. So there are two systems. Uh, the interlizer that you know Lodovico Parmigiani talks about so often and uh, it has been utilized well in clinics and there is also another which is basically gas gaseous filtration of viruses and bacteria and it's very thick Bellinde gas in Sweden. So uh, yeah. these kind of things are going to come ahead uh, in terms of what tissues can be vitrified in the future. Uh, we are looking at trying to vitrify ovarian tissue versus slow freezing. Although most of the births by slow free, uh, have happened by slow freezing in ovarian tissue and testicular tissue as of yet, no, uh, no births have been reported. We also have few reported births from ovarian vitrification from the silver group in US. And uh, it looks quite promising because ovarian vitrification eventually, uh, ovarian tissue vitrification eventually is also easier, quicker, and uh, but I'll bet a little more expensive than slow freezing. So these kind of uh, futuristic uh, uh, parts, uh, you know, uh, especially for fertility preservation of cancer patients and uh, trying to avoid contamination for our patients by sterilizing liquid nitrogen, uh, automatic vitrification right. are the future. Yeah, so the future looks promising, but now considering, you know, uh, all the gadgets that are coming up and especially with the AI setup, it seems that a technical part of an embryologist might not be there in the maybe another 20 years or so. That I disagree, just I disagree with yeah. that, but go on, go on. <laughs> not displaying it, 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 It's like it a brave new world. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen, but uh, you never it know. Things are going to be quite quick. Yeah. Okay, and I think we will have would probably have data embryology scientists at that time. Yeah, yeah that will be the thing. Yeah. Doing clinical the embryology. Like, a, so. like a cavity, you just put it in and it does all the freezing for you. So that is something yeah. the future we are looking forward to. But then the technique, the human hand is yes, the sir. best thing. Human so human that hand. is not we can compare to. That makes a lot of difference. Well, it's not exactly uh, best. Uh, from, uh, yeah. Eventually, you know, automation, automation eventually it is going to get automated. Very true. Yeah. Fine, so I think we are well within the time, but we still have around two or three questions. So, can you uh, uh, get it, uh, yes, Nishad? I'm just trying to, I'm not able to open the window here. Yeah, fine. Again, there is a question regarding the stage of the embryos that is ideal right. to, uh, uh, you know, go for. Who would like to answer that, Dr. Nirmal? Which is the ideal uh, embryo stage again? Yes, yeah, the, the stage of freezing, of course, it is a debate, I would say. Uh, many prefer going up to the blastocyst because you have lesser uh, number of embryos to freeze. 
but i generally prefer freeze if there are super numeri embryos i prefer freezing on day 3 because then i have that uh, window period of you know taking them to blastocyst so uh, it is of course a matter of choice i feel it depends on the yeah, why not go for blastocyst first and then freeze ली <laughs> days we have wherein you thaw them and grow for two days you are sure that the best of the embryo and just not looking green is survivability it has to proceed and it has to hatch and then again so here we have assurance that 100% it has been growing and we can select and yeah. uh, so if i may say so see the assurance is also there even in blastocyst because we still wait till the hatching has happened if you are expand uh, oh, freezing okay. one more thing to be added one, yeah Uh, one so more thing is, uh, if you thaw the day three and culture till day five, uh, there is a problem because when you freeze all in day five, you can choose the best embryo out of it. But in day three, exactly. if you thaw, we don't know which one will come best embryo. Whatever we get, we. Then it will become out. a blastocyst. Also, that is another problem. Yes, yes. That so is, you we, might have a. So, uh, in, yes. in that case, right. yeah. But in that so you case, you can wait till blastocyst for expansion for three to four hours or five hours, and then blast. Okay. You can see that. So it has survived anyways. So you are yeah. avoiding expanded, the whole process. Expanded blastocysts can be, you know, graded before. It, it, it can hatch naturally after a few hours. That uh, that is how we do it uh, for transferring. So and they do. Anyway, yeah. and it doesn't hatch. It collapses, and so we are not sure there. Like. So, but then, then that means that the viability of the embryo is compromised. Blastocysts exactly. are compromised. That could be very similar when you thaw day two. Yeah. Then you will have the few that are collapsed, not open. So, yeah, but when you freeze yeah. on the day three at the base of the embryos, the the conversion rate of like yesterday we were discussing on the group, uh, the conversion rate of uh, it cell to blastocyst it should be around eighty percent. Right, the conversion rate is fine. Conversion, I'm sorry, conversion rate from quality selection of embryo yeah, yeah. will improve the implantation. Eighty percent. So, right. No, that's a bit high. I think it, it, that it, is a little it, high. Yeah. No, no. It when, depends on the patient. I'll, I'll repeat. I'll repeat. Not I'm to, not talking about the number of oocytes. I'm talking about the number of embryos on day three, which right. grade A are there, and then we thought that that conversion rate is high, ninety percent. That grade no, A. Not, a all the, not all. Not all. Not all. Not all. The young yeah. goes to blastocyst stage. It entirely depends upon the basic, uh, yeah. you know, crop of that uh, embryos that you are. Oh, yeah, the crop, yeah. the basic crop. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Let us let us come to the. I want to add this. Uh, I think Kersi has suggested something. I think Sally, you can elaborate slightly on this one. He suggested it. Why not to reduce the uh, concentration of PROH so that we will get uh, you know a little bit better survive the reduce the toxicity as such. Uh, that is what he has suggested. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, what is your take on? So, uh, what Dr. Kersi has a very very valid point, and I think uh, when I came in and Dr. Kersi was already senior, we had discussions with uh, with him regarding this, and he was absolutely. against vitrification but the point was that cpa toxicity has uh, really really reduced in the newer generation of vitrification media and there are few that have really taken out PR, proh completely from the picture propylene glycol has been taken out from the picture in few of the uh, iterations now the newer newer generations which are used for oocytes we don't use proh in many of the uh, Uh, cocktails few of the co cocktails right. that do have proh they have it in co concentration if uh, they have it in conjunction with etoh and dmso and if you talk about the toxicity of dmso dmso no, toxicity no, is very cell yeah. specific okay uh, sorry about my kid arya five minutes okay so uh, basically uh, the uh, the toxicity of dmso is very cell specific even in research 
DMSO is what we use to freeze cells. So DMSO is going to be there regarding whether you use slow freezing or you use uh, vitrification. It's only the concentration that matters. So eventually, when uh, the, the, I mean, Dr. Vijay, when all the studies were done, we know, we have seen that they have done toxicity studies on stem cells, HPSCs, and they have done these uh, studies on the Chinese hamster ovary cell, CHO cells, before they used it on the uh, human oocytes or human embryos. And we saw that CO2 cell toxicity was extremely low when you used a cocktail. And slow freezing was in fact more toxic to CO2 cells than vitrification in a certain concentration. Absolutely. So now CHO cells are the closest component to human uh, gametes. Absolutely too, because this co cocktail, as you mentioned very rightly, you know, it has a different aspect and different penetration uh, permeability for yes. the animals for which they were initially tried and then tested. So the initial papers over the toxicity were based on these animal uh, models. But when they are studied with the using the human zona thickness and the combination and the, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the way the zo uh, human zona reacts to these uh, cocktails, it is slightly different than the uh, um, you know, uh, animal models. And it is now proved to be uh, safer. And that's why we are successfully uh, using it at present. Uh, I would like to ask the organizers to be happy. Uh, uh, Dr. Vijay, I would like to add something, just one minute. Yes. Uh, see, yes, when, the, when it comes to selection of media, we get it from the commercial companies, which only few, like Dr. 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 Ramaraju from this thing, he tries my, um, different combination. He has dared to do his own uh, studies on his uh, concentration of the this thing so that everybody can't afford that because he's having lot number of uh, cases yeah. of freezing and all so he is mm -hmm. only using ethylene glycol and phycol he's not using dm so he's not using pr i've heard that nothing, nothing. Yes. only yes. so it is happening in our own India, but it happens only in that center where he has that daring to use that in his own patients. A center like who is doing five, 10 cases or whichever the big center are there, decision makers are different. There you can't experiment on that. So whatever no. the commercial media is available, that is being used. So there is a limit of that, um, this thing, you know, so demand of what combination or what this thing we have. Yes. Yes, but Srikant, sir, whatever commercial media has come, they have really done their homework, done the homework yes. when it comes to yeah. I, even if they have PROH, they Isn't have it? really done the studies and, and they have shown that there is no, uh, I mean, the toxicity has been lowered as much as right what they said, can. Rightly yeah. said, how old is vitrification? 15 years, some suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when when these uh, these vitrified babies are born, uh, sorry, or embryos are grown up broad in this thing, when the generation will come, is there some generic problem? That is the thing, no? the epigenetic part, we are not aware of whether there are any changes so because of that. That, that is concern, that concern, the, the, the trials and... So I think that data, none of us can say anything. No, no, that that we can just wait for it. Collect the data and wait for it. Trial and test it has to be done then. Right. So we uh, can we move on yeah. to uh, the next question, if you don't mind? Uh, yes. We've got one question uh, from uh, Rashi Kanoi, uh, and she's asking, what is the purpose of using BS during oocyte vitrification? So, anybody can answer. Um, yes. sorry? The BS uh, solution. Mm -hmm. I think she's talking, uh, talking about a particular kit. In uh, Kitasa, you've got the BS solution, uh, yeah. base solution. Right. So, what is the use of BS solution in the oocyte vitrification kit? Why is it used? Solution number two, right? No, oh, that is the first. No, no. Only for the BS. Is given and it's, uh, ah, the BS. BS basically, okay. Yes. BS. They BS. use BS. solution. They yes. use yeah. to uh, gradually increase the uh, concentration of CPA. That's it. Right. Yes. More gentler way of yeah. introducing. Yeah. The oral oral yeah. Yeah. Oral 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 are more fragile than embryos. Exactly. And doctors will tell really you not to use it. But but other <laughs> for that, the media. Yeah, that is why you start with the basic solution that is 20 microliters. You put the inside and immediately you add it. So you know slowly it increases the concentration of CPA and then over a period of next three minutes you add another 20 and then you add 240. That is how it goes. But the total comes out to be 15 minutes only. It is not more than 15 minutes. No, it doesn't. Yes. It is 15 yeah. minutes and it is 300 microliters that you are actually oh. doing the outside freezing in that concentration yeah. and uh, microliters. So right. that's how it goes. Right. Uh, one question, uh, another, which I did find interesting here is what is the role of AI here? How is it going to change vitrification? Any clues, any ideas? Uh, I would like to know anybody's 
Oh, so uh, we would really love if AI could come in and tell us when the embryo is ready to, you know, shift from ES to VS. Because every every embryo has a different time of uh, absolutely coming back to its um, exact volume, to its hundred percent volume. And no embryologist in the world can really tell you if it's at hundred percent volume. However, so we just eyeball it and we do it with experience, but we need a proper scientific, uh, you know, understanding of what is the exact millimeter or what is the diameter comparative. Especially for oocytes, yeah. especially oh, okay. for oocytes, so because they are so I fragile. Love, I'm love when it uh, identifies the growth of the uh, blastomeres and everything and the size and everything. So in that case, same way it can be applied to the vitrification also. After putting into the ES, uh, how long it has to wait? That that uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So sir, exactly, we are saying the same thing. When are they? When are you know they are they are ready to vitrify? Which ones we can start at seven minutes and which one we start at nine minutes? I think Gavi has only the time settings, but there will be a stage where it will identify on its own whether it has been uh, reshaped in the same way what it was at the time of uh, putting into the ES. Right. Yes. So that is the next thing to look forward to, and definitely it seems that the future of uh, vitrification and embryology is very very bright. Yeah. And uh, with that, uh, I think uh, with Vijay yeah. sir, yeah. Uh, we would like to thank all our panelists for such a wonderful discussion and upright, straightforward, wonderful answers. And uh, thank you very much for the organizers for giving us the opportunity to have uh, this wonderful panel. I thank Ihera uh, with Prakash sir for this and the whole team of Ihera for giving us this uh, wonderful chance. And thank you and you have wonderful, have a good evening, all of you. Okay. Thank you, Jaru. Thank you, Ihera. Thank you, Thank you all the panelists. Everybody. Hi, Rahul. Ved, over to you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I would like to thank all of you for the wonderful session we have. And very, uh, I, I can see there are so many people still here, uh, around 80, 90 people per day to listen to uh, that webinar. So, thank you everyone for this wonderful session, all the speakers, all the panelists, moderator, here, uh, can, uh, Nishat, can you please stop here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, I would like to announce one next meeting. Yeah, you can see. Yes, doctor. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, I don't know how it is. Fine. Yeah. So next embark is coming. Second international conference on twenty fourth to twenty fifth July. So please block your dates. So we are again coming with international speakers, debates, lectures, panel, many more things for you. Yes. Extra Vagenja of educational things. Please join us on 24th to 25th July. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, so Thank you very much. Thank you. Doctor, should I end the meeting? Doctor Vipraprash? Just a moment. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you.